up in Austin, Texas. Howdy, y'all. Howdy, Rosemary. George Huntington, GM at Blooming Foods in Bloomington, Indiana, which we remember because if we went to uh, CCMA this year, uh, George made us all feel welcome. Hi, George. Well, good evening to all of you. And Lori Burge, Development Manager at People's Food Co-op in Portland, Oregon. I should mention that uh, Lori is not a GM. Uh, she is a co-manager uh, at a co-op that has a co-management team of people uh, actually managing. So hi, Lori. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, everybody. Great to have everyone today. All right, thanks, Todd. And um, we'll go ahead and start jumping right into uh, what we are going to be covering today. The uh, different learning objectives or desired outcomes that uh, we will be uh, going over include uh, asking the question about why it's important to have a positive board GM relationship. The next one would be to what's it actually mean to have one? What's it? What's it What's it, uh, what's it look like? What's it uh, defined as? We're going to take a look at what leads to a positive relationship. And this is going to be where we spend a lot of our time, um, including the board, GM, joint responsibilities, in terms of foundational work that might be done up front and ongoing work that uh, involves continuous improvement. And finally, uh, about a guiding model um, where we'll go through each uh, of the contributing factors toward a positive board GM relationship, including shared purpose, clarity of roles, robust systems, and healthy interpersonal relationships. So how will we use this uh, 60 minutes? Uh, it's going to be relatively tight. We're going to um, spend this first 15 minutes going over introducing the topic and its importance. Then we'll discuss the components, uh, the model of building a positive relationship, and we'll introduce that uh, model. And then we'll discuss each of these. Now, on each of these, the time's relatively tight, so we'll try to move this along. Um, we'll have about a minute to introduce it. And each of the panelists will take turns uh, discussing um, the component. And then uh, other panelists, guests, will chime in. And finally, we're hoping that we'll have a bit of time left over and uh, basically for Q&A, and we'll just use whatever we have left up till uh, the end of the hour. So with that, I will turn it over to Todd to address uh, these questions. What does it mean and why it is important to have a positive board GM relationship? This is why we're here today, um, to ask you know, this large question of what does it mean to us and what does having a positive board GM relationship bring to our co-op? Why is it important? I'm going to go through uh, each of the panel guests and ask them to ruminate a little bit about these questions and share what they think. Um, so I'm going to start with Amy. Um, Amy, if you could uh, tell us what you think these questions mean to you. Well, I would say um, I believe a positive board GM relationship is is really based on, on trust and respect. Um, and what I, I think that it's really important because we're setting, we're setting the agenda for how the broader co-op is going to interact. So if the board and the general manager have a positive working relationship, the general manager is then, that's going to be reflected in their relationship with their staff and it will be reflected in the board's relationship with the member owners and then all the way around with the staff's relationship with the member owners. So I think it's up to us to really set the tone of how, how relationships should be within the co-op. That's great. That's great. You know, one thing um, that I heard you say that I thought was interesting was how uh, the effects of that relationship kind of ripple out. Yes. And I actually, like, when I think of that, I, I think about actually even going beyond the member owners and actually out into the broader community. Sure. I agree. Great. Um, so thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori, uh, what about you? Um, well, I would say that um, what it means to me is having clarity, honesty, good communication, and respect. And I think that some of the difference that it makes 
um, the positive, what a positive relationship does is that when we have clarity, when we all know our roles, and when we're able to, uh, we can work together. We kind of um, know how to make the wheels turn <laughs> so that we can make a difference um, and makes us more effective towards being able to reach our ends um, and also just running the business. So there, we can really see that you know, our finances are being managed to the best of our ability. Things are clear, so the board knows what their role is observing that, and the management knows what our end is in making that happen. So the day-to-day -day and getting those things good, and then it, it frees us up to be able to, to reach our ends because we work well together. And that affects our, not only our owners, but I also would agree that that does affect our, the difference that we're able to make on the broader community. Wonderful, which is, which is the reason why we're here, ultimately. Uh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, George, uh, what do you think? Well, Todd, it's, uh, when you're down in the pecking order, uh, several things you were going to speak about have been spoken about already. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mind reiterating them. Uh, Amy mentioned that that concept of uh, mutual trust and respect as being uh, very important uh, in that relationship. Um, I think it, it goes without saying that it's obvious that a positive relationship certainly is better than a negative one. Uh, in my stint as general manager, I've had both, and I can tell you all that a positive relationship certainly uh, is superior to a negative one. Uh, the whole idea of the board being supportive of the general manager is one that I can't stress enough. Uh, if you've got a good, strong relationship, you respect each other, you communicate clearly, um, that support becomes evident, um, and it makes the general manager move forward in a way that allows him or her uh, to feel good about supporting uh, his or her staff. Uh, the staff, in turn, want to go about uh, executing their roles uh, and supporting their communities. And the whole thing does snowball. I think you, you commented on that, Todd. Uh, it starts at the top with the board of directors, and it does indeed ripple all the way down. Um, I think it, the relationship is important uh, because it, it helps allow uh, for some longevity, both at the board level and particularly at the general manager level. Uh, it mitigates turnover. Um, and, and without a doubt, your community is enhanced when there is a strong relationship between the board and the general manager. It goes without saying that if you get along, you'll perform better. So those are kind of my thoughts on it. Those are, are wonderful thoughts, George. And uh, I, pre I mean, it didn't sound, I mean, you, you repeated some common themes that are, that are being brought up, but it was by no means repetitive. So, <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so Rosemarie, so... Okay, you, you can you have the challenge of, of bringing something new or uh, actually <laughs> reiterating but making this uh, this uh, positive echoing effect. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Well, I definitely would um, support all the uh, comments that have been made so far. I mean, we are going to talk about roles and that role clarity. And to me, I think one of the sort of the crux of it is being on each other's side while at the same time understanding each other's authority and accountability. So the GM knows that they're accountable to the board, and the board also has to understand that they're not professional experts at running the store. So I think one of the challenges with the idea of a positive relationship is that you know, we know that that means you know, being pleasant and professional and even nurturing, and then that's a, definitely a, a better scenario than the negative. I think one of the challenges with that and, and finding that um, happy, um, pleasant relationship with each other is also to be fearless in maintaining our accountability. And I think, you know, we're going to talk about roles. That, that is a really important component of how we we are most, most effective in our work. Todd, can I interject for just a moment? This is George. Please, George. Yeah, I had a story that I wanted to tell. I had a, a relationship with a former board member. This was many years ago that wasn't going maybe as, as well as it should have. It seemed like this individual and myself were butting heads much more often than we should have, and it was before uh, my board had really elevated itself. And I, I asked to have breakfast with this uh, individual one day, and I said, you know, when I was a kid, my brother and I used to go out to a lake, 
uh, that my uncle owned, and we used to get in a canoe, and we'd go out in the middle of the lake, and he'd get in the canoe, and he'd face one direction, and I would face the other direction, and we would paddle like madmen to see who could win. And at, at the end of a half an hour of paddling, we were both still sitting in the middle of the lake, exhausted, and we got nowhere. And then one of us would turn around, and we'd paddle in the same direction, and we'd get to where we wanted to go. And I kind of told this analogy to my board member, and all of a sudden, the whole idea of us being on the same team and rowing in the same direction and getting along made all kinds of sense. And it was just something as simple as a little game my brother and I used to play when we were kids. So that was just a way that I helped convey the concept of being on the same page, rowing in the same direction, and getting to where you want to be. That's a great story. And actually, you know, something, uh, well, you said it before, and uh, Rosemary said it, and Lori mentioned, um, you know, the sort of big picture of why uh, co-ops exist and, and why, uh, you know, we're, we're out there uh, to do, uh, to achieve something larger. And uh, really, uh, in my opinion, you know, if, if, it, if it's a negative relationship that's going on, the negative relationship becomes the thing. It becomes what we're focused on. And like you said in your story, it becomes impossible then to actually achieve this larger goal. Um, that kind of fades away. So thanks uh, for those wonderful insights, panelists. I am going to move us forward. I'm going to turn it over to Art to talk a little bit about um, the model that we want to share with you. All right. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Um, and I can, I can picture George being out in that, that case. <laughs> Um, it gets a little muggy around here too, Art. It was really hot. That, that's it. Uh, George and I are members of the same co-op here in Indiana. So, um, let me move us into uh, the components and model of a positive uh, board GM relationship. Todd and I sat down and we talked to some a lot of folks, and of course we've been working um, with with co-ops and tried to gather some shared wisdom about the sorts of things that might be antecedents or lead toward uh, actually creating or building a positive board GM relationship. And after talking with everyone, we narrowed it down to four uh, components which have a relationship. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to ultimately go through each of these components and talk about um, some potential definitions for them and uh, gain some of the experiences from um, our, our panelists. And uh, what I'll do right now is, is walk you through them. So as you can see on this model, we've got shared purpose, role clarity, robust systems, and interpersonal relationships. Again, we'll, we'll define each of these more clearly. But I think the, the titles generally speak for themselves. And what I want to explain here is the interrelationship between them. The first one is shared purpose. Uh, it's vital in our co-ops that the board and GM, in order to have a positive relationship, find uh, some shared purpose. And I think we've already heard some of this uh, in, in the initial um, discussion that we've been having. Finding some alignment and making sure that we're paddling our canoe um, in generally the same direction. Uh, the second one is while we're doing that, uh, Oh boy, I can see an att an, a canoe analogy running all the way through here, George, so I might be in trouble. Um, uh, with role clarity, uh, it's important not only to have shared purpose, but as the, the team of the, the board and GM uh, work to accomplish that shared purpose, they each have clear roles. The board has one, and the GM and the, and, uh, the management has another and speaking with one another and, and gaining a shared understanding of the clarity of these roles in order to accomplish this shared purpose is important. The third one is to have robust systems, and robust meaning strong or things that uh, will put up with uh, some stormy weather. And building those systems is important because as each of the, the two entities gains its role clear, it needs robust systems in order to accomplish their shared purpose. And finally, it's important to have interpersonal relationships that are healthy. 
it's not enough for the long-term sustainability uh, of the relationship to simply have robust systems, clear roles, and shared purpose. We're humans and we work together, and it's important that we have uh, healthy interpersonal relationships to use those robust systems in our clear roles to ultimately accomplish that shared purpose. So what we'll do now is we will move into talking about each of these different components. And the first one we're going to talk about is shared purpose. And Todd's going to walk us through the definition, and then we'll open it up to a panelist. So Todd. All right. Thank you, Art. Um, well, so when I think of shared purpose, uh, what I think about is a sense of shared understanding that we, uh, the board, the management, and the member owners, um, we're working to accomplish something uh, together. Um, we have alignment, engagement, and commitment to the long-range direction uh, evolution of our organizations, of our co-ops. Um, to me, this relates directly to the history of our co-op, um, of our movement. Co-ops were invented, uh, institutions invented specifically by groups of people who came together to achieve a kind of common purpose or goal that they could not achieve individually. So this, to me, this goes to the heart of why we exist. Um, okay, and so uh, Rosemarie, um, if you could share any thoughts you have about the importance of a shared purpose, examples of how uh, that concept has played a role in your co-op, or, or any insights on how to build it, uh, that would be great. Thanks, Todd. Um, to me, this idea of shared sense of purpose means that we really support each other in achieving a common goal. And one way that I think we do this is by sort of echoing each other's messages. So I think that, I, I'm sorry? I think this is, in a way, I think contrasting this idea of like, you know, that we do have separate roles and we shouldn't confuse the fact that we do have distinct roles. This idea of echoing each other's messages is a way that we show this alignment, that we understand the common purpose that we have. So one example I would give is that Dan, our general manager, has determined to make us the friendliest store in town. And he works really hard at doing this. And he lets the board know, especially in his monthly GM reports. He tells us about how this is happening through you know, internal training, for example, or consumer surveys and how they're responding um, and uh, how we're, we're performing relative to this goal. And so we as a board understand this intention, and we are able to sort of resonate in our conversations with owners that this is part of our identity. And we can even uh, make observations to Dan and tell him stories about how we, we are seeing ourselves as the friendliest store in town. Um, likewise, perhaps there's a board level message that relates to the mission statement that's included in our bylaws. For us, that's to promote the transformation of society toward cooperation, justice, and non-exploitation. Which I love. <laughs> I and, love uh, that too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> um, and, you know, Dan, our GM, understands and echoes this idea so that it becomes a part of our fabric and culture. So I think that the way we understand our purpose is actually the most important as an existential question for organization. And um, so we routinely spend meeting time and have learning discussions and explore these ideas. I think that there is a huge fundamental difference if we understand that we exist to sell awesome food, for example, versus to transform society. And we come to a mutual understanding about our sort of raison d'etre um, through regular exploration of the topic so that we create this alignment. Wonderful. Ah, th thanks. That's, that's great. Um, one question for you, Rosemary. Mm -hmm. um, I know you all just finished a huge project. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm just curious. Um, did it, was it a shared uh, sense of purpose or alignment key to the successful development of that project? It absolutely was. Um, and, you know, this, it, it was a long, long process, you know, starting from developing the concept way back when between the board, the general manager, and the ownership, um, all the way through, especially, you know, the really challenging times of the project, and then celebrating together. So, you know, the importance of this is really so that we really are supporting each other's work and, and moving the whole organization forward. And this really helps um, come up with the best ideas 
and the best, uh, help us realize our best potential. And, you know, this analogy, I love this analogy that George made of, you know, rowing the canoe in the same direction and being part of a team that we're able to really support each other rather than antagonize each other or do things that we might not even realize are um, sort of counterproductive to the whole organization. Great. So I uh, guess to, just to give you a brief specific example, um, go for it. You know, it was really important to for Dan, our general manager, to share with the board, you know, what he and his staff were going through and what the upcoming challenges were so that we could understand that. And then also to he had a a message weekly for his employees and it was helpful for the board to understand that so that we could feel confidence in the project. And then also I think to um, support that message again, just really like echo this thing with our entire being so that the organization really resonated this message and we could all get it. Excellent, excellent. And I assume that you all as a board had to create that alignment among yourselves as well. Oh, we did indeed. That's a great question because we certainly had a diversity of opinion um, on many levels. We had um, people that had maybe seemingly sort of an agenda that we needed to kind of work together to learn about, you know, where we all are, what our sort of one voice message is. Um, and, you know, another example would be people that are interested in certain um, aspects of the renovation project that, you know, we had people that had construction experience and things like that that were particularly curious about the ins and outs and we had to together really work on um, where that fit into our plenary discussion uh -huh. and the accountability chain. Not make, making sure that people are focused. Yes, and that we don't you know, spend the entire meeting. It's really fascinating to hear the ins and outs of how the project's going and what, you know, Dan's learning just a, an enormous amount of, of things and facing enormous amount of decisions and challenges and that that's not really the board's work. Um, one thing that's interesting about that, I think, is also this, you know, the, it, it ties into the clarity of roles, but also the interpersonal relationship and this, this feeling of trust, kind of knowing that you can ask questions and that within reason we're going to try and answer them or address them somehow, and also as a group can decide when that's really just not on the table for the board to discuss. That's great, and I just want to reiterate what Art said earlier, was that these things do overlap with each other. So I'm glad you pointed out that you know there was an interpersonal uh, communication issue there, um, but it led to this to this shared purpose. Uh, thanks, Rosemary. Um, I'd love to open it up. Yeah, I'd love to open it up now to anybody else who'd like to talk about this sort of this sort of concept. This is Lori. Hey, Lori. Um, from People's to Co-op, and I was going to add that I think that some ways that. Um, our board has been working on unity of purpose, or our board and management, our collective management has been working on this. Is, um, for example, we have a really long, um, what has been fairly drawn out um, development pro uh, process of assessing our development ideas. What direction do we want to go in, and what specific ideas we might want to implement? Um, that's had various different points where we've kind of like slowed down um, in the process. But um, some things that our board has done um, around kind of building unity of purpose um, has been, you know, speaking to the development process and really owning it um, from a governance standpoint, um, even though it's been conducted by the collective management. So um, speaking to the places where the board has been um, monitoring um, the work that we've been doing, you know, various different policies, both on the limitations end and, and also on the end side. Um, and, and then also writing articles um, with that perspective. Um, and um, even smaller things, such as like coming to focus groups that the management has held with member owners to test different ideas. And then, of course, um, more publicly, you know, speaking to that um, work that's happening um, at annual membership meetings. And then um, from the management side, also, I've been working to write every month a report to our staff as, as a whole about um, just kind of like a newsletter, um, one-page newsletter about what's happened at the board meeting in the last month. That's just a quick little snippet so that people can see and just working to build um, unity of purpose that way so that we're, we know what the topics are that are going on and understand what the main board perspectives are on those areas that they're working on. 
That's great. Um, would you say that that's been helpful in, uh, for example, building equity? Building equity as far as like owner equity? Absolutely. I would, th I, would I think so. I mean, I think that in a lot of ways, um, because people feel like they understand, you know, at the ownership level what the board is doing, mm -hmm. and by and large, um, the member owners understand that. Like, for example, um, you know, building member ownership, we have very successful equity drives. Right. Um, and we have, you know, really good, um, we had a lot of support for our, our change to move to a patronage refund, for example. So that was a, you know, that was across the board place where we had a lot of unity of purpose about wanting to make our cooperative really solid and wanting to build the financial foundation so that we can look to the future of, well, you know, what's next for people to co-op? So I think that through that work, through having the board speak from their pers their angle on things and having management speak from our angle on things and kind of you know echoing each other but from our own places I think that it, that has helped um, you know with building equity and shared ownership and and of course we had you know for the patronage decision that we had which is it's not exactly equity but it does end up being you know building a strong sense of ownership we saw through that as we had the best voter turnout that we ever had, and we had the um, about 78% of our member owners voted in favor of making that change. When at first it seemed like people had a lot of trepidation and fear about losing the 4% discount that we had at the register, mm -hmm. and that was the place where this is connected in equity, and in that that is the place where we really started sowing the seed of this idea of um, of building equity and building the commonwealth um, of our cooperatives and having um, the multiple bottom line of not only financial but social and environmental um, bottom lines <laughs> that yeah, we're trying yeah. to make happen together and the difference we're trying to make happen together and how they interrelate to each other. And I think that we've been able to build a more sophisticated conversation through having the board doing you know, speaking to this in their place, and then also doing study, because our board does a lot of study engagement, which is looking into depth in various different topics, which has been, the past two years, has been focused around building a cooperative economy. So that relates a lot to the work that the collective management has been doing, which is around, hmm, like what kind of difference can we make in the world as a cooperative and as a cooperative food store? That's, so that's great. that's great. Those have been playing off of each other a lot, and we've been able to build a lot of community momentum um, around kind of expanding our idea um, of peoples as a grocery store to peoples as a cooperative institution that works to, you know, that has ends <laughs> to create change in our community. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that because I want to move on. But that was um, uh, a great, excellent expression of those of those ideas, Laurie. Um, thank you so much. Um, Art, I want to turn it over to you to the next um, uh, concept. All right. Um, forgive my uh, pop-ups there. My keyboard, for some reason, is not allowing me to push them forward. So anyway, um, so clarity of rules leads to board GM relationship. This is the next component that we have. Um, when we went out and started you know, searching out what are the things that lead to this? This theme kept uh, popping up, and clearly we've heard it already here today. And so we've defined it as having clear understanding of what tasks, jobs, and functions the board as a unified body will directly control, and uh, what of those things will delegate to management. And of course, uh, the things that delegates to management, it truly really does delegate to management, and of course the things that doesn't delegate to management it needs to make sure it takes responsibility for. So we will, with that definition, we'll ask our next guest to talk about clarity of roles, uh, give some examples of uh, how it's played a role um, in creating a positive board relationship, and um, how, how we might go about creating this. So who am I turning this to, Todd? I have George uh, on the list to speak on this. If he's okay with that. Sure. Um, clarity of roles is incredibly important uh, when it comes to board GM relationships. Um, 
and at least at our organization, we we have alignment in how we look at that, and we tend to look at the board's role in our organization as being one of uh, looking forward, uh, kind of charting the direction that our co-op might go. You might say the board's role is a directional role, and then the staff role is uh, more one of an operational role. Uh, we're trying to execute at the operational level uh, so we can achieve uh, that future vision that our board uh, has set forth. Um, it wouldn't be surprising to anyone that if both board and uh, management are trying to make operational decisions, for example, if we're both trying to decide what kind of granola we want in the fourth bulk bin from the left, that there might be some confusion in regard <laughs> to clarity of roles. Um, and so we have uh, we have very clear distinction here. Um, some of what we do here interfaces with that uh, that shared purpose. Uh, one of the most important things that my board has done for this organization is to articulate kind of a global ends policy, and that that global ends policy that they've articulated uh, in conjunction with. Uh, the cooperative principles have created a framework uh, or a filter system, if you will, that, that management utilizes in, in executing things at an operational level. Uh, we've all agreed, both board and staff, that we're going to operate a values-based business. Uh, and then we set about doing that. Um, my board is very good about not, not getting involved uh, in our operational decisions. Uh, they have created executive limitations for us, telling us what they don't want us to do. Uh, and pretty much everything else is fair game. It has freed us to be able to be creative uh, in how we operate our co-op and to do a lot of good work in the community. Um, probably, I'm trying to think of something other than a canoe analogy, Art. Yeah. Um, you know, a good example of, of uh, that, that ends-driven uh, uh, basis that we use here is uh, my board might tell me um, the most important thing you need to do uh, is to be, and not tell me, but create a policy that indicates I need to get to San Francisco, and you need to be there by the end of the month. Uh, and then it's up to me to decide uh, whether I want to take the northern route and go through the Dakotas or whether I'm better served kind of swinging down there and, and saying hi to my friends in Wheatsville in Texas. Uh, or maybe I decide I want to drive across the plains in Kansas. But there are many ways to get there. And those operational decisions are left up to us uh, based on the ends that we're attempting to achieve. No, that's great, George. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Um, but, you know, basically, I see my job description as having basically two features. I'm 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 charged with achieving the end results uh, that my board wish to see, and then I need to stay within the boundaries that they've set based on those executive limitations. And it's been a very freeing experience that things are that clear for me. So it sounds like uh, not only it made your uh, relationship. Uh, stronger and more positive, but uh, makes your job as a general manager um, a lot more fun. Well, yes, <laughs> that's a simple answer to that question. Um, I'd invite the other, uh, any of the other panelists to. Uh, we have a minute or two uh, left on this component. Uh, other examples or thoughts about the importance or insights on how to create clarity of roles. Um, uh, this is Amy. I have a, a comment on this, just on the really how important this clarity of roles is when it comes to accountability. Um, there are times when the board of directors is just itching to get their hands into the details of, of something that's really in, in the management realm. Um, and it's kind of human nature. It's exciting to get involved in some of those things sometimes. But then um, once we've gotten our hands in there, but you know, it's really not, um, it, it's not fair or appropriate to hold the general manager accountable for the outcome of whatever that is, because we've we've somewhat dictated 
how it should proceed. So I think it's just critical if you want to hold the general manager accountable to, to make sure there is a clarity of roles and, and to stay on the correct side of or in, within the correct boundaries of, of what you've established. This is Rosemary. I'd love to jump into just mentioning this idea of you know how to create clarity of roles. I really think it's so important to continue learning and talking about what our job is and, and how we understand that. I think um, one thing that's been a really important insight to me is this idea that you know really intelligent, well-meaning people come together and they don't intuitively know what to do. And so we have to learn and understand what our process is going to be. And I think that that's an ongoing conversation. Well, thanks you all, and uh, we'll uh, we'll leave it at that as well. Um, maybe be able to get a chance to come back to it more. I'm sure it's going to relate to uh, the next pieces that we have, and I'll turn it back over to Todd. Thanks uh, everyone for those great insights. Next, moving on to robust systems. Robust systems. Okay. Well, what do we mean when we say that? Um, so we can think of robust systems as uh, formal systems of communication. Uh, including policies, and actually uh, George outlined this, and, and Amy kind of talked about this as well, um, clear expectations for management and for the board. And when I say uh, for the board, uh, we mean uh, for the board to understand uh, the nature of its work, the work that it's going to be doing, and of course to understand that board management relationship. Uh, also, uh, well-established monitoring of those policies because it's not enough to have expectations. We have to, in order to fulfill our uh, accountability uh, function, which Rosemary mentioned earlier, uh, we have to check it to see if um, those expectations are being met. And then uh, also, uh, you could include uh, robust, effective systems for a fair uh, GM evaluation and a determining of compensation. And I just want to make a point to note that those last two subjects, uh, evaluation and compensation, are dealt with uh, in, in quite a bit of detail in another uh, online recorded workshop available in the CBUILD library. We have one specifically called GM Evaluation and another called uh, uh, Setting a Process for uh, GM Compensation. And uh, those are uh, presented by um, some of our other colleagues, uh, Carly Coulter, Mark Goring, and Thane Joyal. So um, I re uh, recommend that people who want to learn more specific information about those two uh, aspects to check out our CBO library. Um, now I'm going to move on to a panelist and maybe get some thoughts on robust systems and what they mean to that person. Uh, I have you, Lori, on the list to talk about uh, some of these aspects. Great. Well, I think that the importance of robust systems is that we can create all this um, theory and even all this practice around um, having good relationships. And without having robust systems um, in place um, for this communication to kind of play out, um, like you can't just have policies without monitoring, or you can't really have monitoring without policies. Um, you, those, having those in place, having that together creates and maintains the balance. Um, so it's like there's a good theory, but without the checking, you don't really know if you're staying on course. Um, and then by having robust systems, that ensures accountability. Um, so at Peoples, we use um, Policy is really at the center of our formal systems and communication. We use policy governance, um, and we have for, um, I think, since 2007. Um, and that creates a lot of, you know, clear, there's a really clear process for how that works. So we have executive limitations, management, delegation, governance process, and ends. And we really need the communication, we need the policies that are the restrictions and the, the direction for the management, but we also need to have a health, through to have a healthy relationship. We also need the board to have their policies and to be monitoring those as well. Um, and that together, by having those, is what really maintains clarity and helps us to be able to um, build a good system to work together. So um, we have a really regular reporting process um, for through policy governance. 
uh, or on all of our policies that we have with our policy governance system um, in those four um, areas. And those are calendared. And so some of them are you know, quarterly, like our financial conditions, and some of them are annual. And some of them are annual, but can happen more frequently as needed. For example, if an event triggers um, needing to do more frequent monitoring, like we get closer to a decision about a development idea that we're looking at, then in order to maintain a good relationship and have trust and, and, and be able to maintain the responsibility we have as managers, um, we need to provide a report to the board so that they know, you know we're doing the right things. Um, and we're avoiding the bad things. <laughs> um, and our reports are due um, eight to 10 days in advance before the board meeting. Um, on the management side, um, I coordinate the reports from various contributors. Some of those reports have one contributor. Some of them have 12, like our ENDS reports. Um, and I work with our writers to basically make sure that we're getting good data that's going to be really useful for the board. Um, and who I work with is based on their job description. Of, of course. Um, and then always one, I think one really important thing for having robust systems and it really is respectful for the board's time um, is to have a plan in place if you are not um, in compliance. So if you're not meeting an expectation from the board, it's really important for us to have a plan in place and that includes steps and a timeline, um, when and how we're going to remeasure um, our improvements that we've made and a time to, to report back to the board on the sections where we weren't doing so well. And I think that not only respects the board's time um, and creates a reciprocal respect, but it also helps keep the board, so it keeps that clarity of role because it keeps the board from needing to negotiate or want to delve into problem solving. So that's been super effective for us. And then on the board side, they've developed a system that works for them to monitor our reports that involves looking, um, it's, they've come up with a specific system that works for them where they're looking at the reasonableness um, and of the interpretations and the adequateness of the data and also looking at whether the policy works for them. Um, and it it's really works really well now that we know exactly how to do it because it's really clear for me. I know what my role is in the process when I'm sitting in the meeting reporting the board and the board knows what theirs is. Um, and that's been really beneficial. Um, another thing to point out is that I track and report through our communications, um, communication and board support report, um, the timeliness of our reports, as well as how, how often we're out of compliance with those reports. And so that's creating a lot of trust and, and transparency um, within that as well. As for compensation, I don't really have um, in uh, GM uh, accountability, I don't have a lot to say about that because our board basically evaluates us on our monitoring process because we're a collective management model. Um, so it's a little bit different for us within that realm. One, I, there's one thing I wanted to, to mention um, that I thought about was in order to achieve these systems, in order for them to work the way you're talking about, I would think that it would take quite a bit of uh, commitment on the board's part to understand and learn them. Mm -hmm. um, and some time spent, some effort spent to, to do that. Uh, right. you know. uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe we just have a minute left. Does anybody want to speak to the idea of robust systems? This is Rosemary. I would love to just add a couple of thoughts on that. Go for it. Um, to, me, to me, the idea of the robust system is something that's really going to hold up, and I, I love this mention of like theory versus practice, um, but the, the robust system can really endure having you know, new people on the board or a constantly changing board composition, um, which is something that can really challenge you know, the board GM relationship and the process altogether. So I know for me that's been an interesting challenge with, uh, I have a very new board, and uh, I really, I have to make my little CDS plug here that you know, just the training that we have received and the fact that it's available and these resources are available to help people learn what our system is and the process has really helped create a robust system for us. And then our board has, for the past couple of years, and I think with a special focus this year, been working on developing sort of an internal infrastructure um, of making documentation accessible to all and really understanding like what we need to, um, to have this sort of, I, I mean you can use the word robust again, the system that 
that people can just pick up and use and what's the best way of doing that. We don't want people to be swamped in you know, ex excessive amounts of documentation because they're not going to read it anyway, but at the same time um, making things available to all so that people aren't reinventing the wheel and can kind of learn from our, our past actions. So for example, maintaining files and notes of um, subcommittee meetings that are shared so that people have the opportunity to go back has helped kind of increase the, uh, the resilience of our process. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, thanks for those additions, Rosemary. I'm uh, going to move this. Quick, oh, can I, go, can okay, I make George? a quick comment, Todd? Yeah, uh, I, I want to echo that comment about the continuity that a robust system helps with an organization. Uh, yeah. Imagine your boss changes conceivably every year or every other year. <laughs> uh, we do have a democratically controlled uh, organization here and that your boss's direction for your organization changes that often. And when you wear a general manager's hat, that is a pretty scary thought. When you've got robust systems that help institutionalize the memory and the direction of the organization, it does allow those new board members to step into those roles. It's a transparent and robust system that allows them to understand what's going on uh, and eliminates a lot of those fears that general managers have about getting this whole new board that's going to take us a whole new direction. I've spent the last three years rowing in one direction, and now all of a sudden I have to turn around and do a 180. So a robust, a robust system is incredibly important. Yeah, great okay, great uh, addition. Thank you, George. Uh, I'm going to move it on to Art for the next one. All right. Well, that was great, and I'm... I'm a uh, if you ever spend any time talking to me about these things, you'll you'll know that I'm a huge uh, advocate of having strong systems that uh, perpetuate positive culture over time. So mm -hmm. um, now we're going to talk a bit about I think we get into con culture issues and talking about a healthy interpersonal relationship and how we act with one another day to day. And we define this as the softer side of the board GM relationship, including qualities like res respectful treatment and discourse, integrity, candor, and an honest effort to put forth uh, uh, effort put forth to ensure effective interpersonal communications. You know, when we were talking about this, uh, when we when we mentioned uh, we were talking about this with Marilyn Scholl, who, as many of you may know, um, has served in in many roles, including general manager, and she was like. You can't even imagine the importance of just simply being giving a sincere thanks to the to a general manager from a, from the board, which is just that's kindergarten stuff. But for some reason, we tend to forget sometimes. <laughs> um, so I will turn this over to our final panelists to address this, and uh, then we'll see where we're at with time. Okay, um, this is Amy again, and and. Really, I have some just some a few th a small list of things that I think are critical um, to have this good relationship, and, it, and it's not things that are spelled out in on paper necessarily. Um, but the first is the trust and the belief in each other. Um, it's been interesting to watch. I've been on the board for seven years now, and as we get new board members, um, we do um, have contested elections, and sometimes some people are elected to the board, and they're coming on with with maybe a little bit upset about some things that have happened and so they're coming on with a kind of a distrustful mindset of the general manager and sometimes of other board members um, and how that just really undermines um, what we're trying to accomplish overall when there's not that trust or belief to to allow the general manager to do in our case his job um, and on the flip side of that, you know, it's the general manager's belief and trust in, in the board that we are going to do the right thing and that when we are um, in our role interacting with member owners that, that to give us a little bit of latitude um, that, that we're not going to take us down a rabbit hole and into a side issue. And so it's really having a, a good relationship developed um, it really helps to build that trust and belief in each other. and. Um, that leads into the treating each other with respect and the respectful treatment. Um, I'm, I've been interesting watching our general manager, who's, who's been with us for quite a while, um, but who has a long history with co-ops and, and uh, has come in and kind of at the ground level and, and worked his way up. And he's lived and breathed the idea of co-ops and truly believes in, in the co-op um, concept. 
the co-op business model. And as soon as he becomes a general manager and, and an empowered general manager of a, of a larger co-op as we've grown, I think people's, some people's perceptions of him, of him change and all of a sudden uh, that he's perceived as the man and that it's okay to, uh, to not treat him so well. And uh, the, the, there isn't always respect on the part of some of the member owners and every once in a while a board member and how they treat them and it's just kind of reminding people that, hey, you know, we are in this together and as George talked about, we are, if we paddle in the same direction, we're, we're going to get there faster, but um, that, it, that it's not okay to, uh, to treat people with disrespect. Um, our, our general manager, has, I'm always amazed at how he can uh, kind of let things run off his back and how he, he tends to always treat people with respect. So he's, he's very good on that component with, with board members and member owners. Um, open communication is really key, and there's the formal lines of communication, but I think developing those informal lines of communication between the board and the general manager is, is really critical. Um, when I started in my tenure as president, the general manager and I would meet quite frequently just to just to have a little time to kind of see what was going on in each other's heads and, and to kind of get a read on where I thought the board was at on, on certain issues and where he felt that he and management and staff were at on certain issues so that we could kind of um, get a game plan together or, or just understand that how we could avoid some snarls down the road just to be just to be clear on on, on what was going on in the broader picture. Um, and there have been times, I mean, being candid with the general manager is really critical, and you don't have to do that in a nasty way. Um, you can do it in a nice way and, and, and be firm sometimes and just say, hey, we, we don't think that you are meeting the board's goals, and, and if you change course now, you, you, you're really going to save everyone a lot of trouble if you take this issue a little more seriously. But you, you can do that in a, in a way that's really being more helpful with the general manager than, than being critical. Um, this is a, an example of where we had a situation that was getting a little bit, um, I think, out of control on how we brought it back around. And I think this is really goes to the heart of how it's the responsibility of each and every board member to make sure that the board is behaving in a respectful manner um, and that we all need to be willing to step forward and voice our opinions, and even sometimes when it's really uncomfortable. Um, but we uh, we were in the we've been in a multi-year process around a, a very important issue, and everybody has very strong feelings about it. Um, and we've interacted with member owners and gotten lots of feedback and input. And, and uh, the general manager then came back to us with an implementation plan, and it didn't necessarily look how a few board members thought it should look, and and they were very interested in the details. And so it came to several board meetings. Um, and there was just very constant negative feedback, board meeting after board meeting, and that's really all that was being heard was some kind of nasty negative feedback. And I, I didn't like it, but I hadn't thought much about it until I was touching base with the general manager, and I was really sensing that he was getting very discouraged um, overall. And a person, he's a person that has quite a bit of confidence in what he's doing that I felt that confidence slipping um, and that this negative feedback was it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that it, it was going to cause this to fail just because it was constantly negative and it was, it was wearing things down. Um, so it also caused the program to be stalled and there was the sense that it was the general manager's fault that things were stalled, but really I felt the responsibility lied with the, with the board or lay with the board because we were the one putting the roadblocks up because there wasn't trust around the fact that his plan was a good plan. Um, so what, what we ended up doing is the rest of the board members, you know, it's kind of everybody was called in to, to really step forward and number one, step in when, when the general manager was being treated with disrespect and say that it wasn't okay to treat anyone like that. And also that we, to give positive feedback and say that we supported this and that we were going to give the general manager time to implement the plan and then come back and report to us as he does with everything else. And then, then we can see that if he's, if he's uh, meeting the ends. And so I think 
it's really critical that board members understand their, their responsibilities to step in when they see that, that these lines are being crossed. And you maybe can't put your finger on it because it doesn't necessarily conflict with a policy that you've set. But it, but it is the warm and fuzzy of making sure that, that people are giving positive reinforcement and a sense of belief and that there is respect. Um, I think, you know, overall, if you have this positive board general manager relationship and you're able to, to talk to each other, you're going to have a much more fulfilling experience whether you're on the board or whether you're a staff member. Um, and I, I don't think anybody wants to be part of a board general manager dynamic that is a constant fight or struggle. Um, so I think it, it's important that people step forward and, and uh, step in to sometimes uncomfortable situations and, uh, and try to, to set it on the straight course again. All right. Well, thank you so much for that and that, mm -hmm. great, uh, and that great story. Um, we're right up against our uh, hour, and uh, you know, I could keep talking about this stuff forever, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it to Todd, who might uh, take us um, through looking at uh, what some of our learning objectives are that we wanted to cover. Say a few final words, and if there's a, a minute left or so, perhaps he'll he'll uh, be able to allow uh, a final comment or, or two from some folks. Okay, today we got together and we heard some wonderful stories um, about why it is important to have a positive board gym relationship, what it means to have that positive board gym relationship, um, and what leads to it. Um, the, the foundational work and the, and the ongoing uh, continuous improvement work. Um, we thought about a model that discussed four concepts, shared purpose, clarity of roles, robust systems, and healthy interpersonal relationships. Um, we do want to wrap it up uh, very soon, but I want to give our amazing panelists today a chance to leave us with one, one small nugget of wisdom. Any of you, can you just put it out there in maybe 20 seconds? This is Rosemary. I guess my, uh, my nugget might be, I think that it's really important to give each other full authority without ego, and that that is just an important thing in dealing with people in general, but especially in the context of board GM relationships. So just honoring each other's full authority in the realms that they operate without letting any egos get in the way. Wonderful. Anybody else? This is Lori. I wanted to add two mini nuggets. Um, one of them is uh, say what you mean. I think being honest and direct is super important. It's better to know now than later. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to add in relation to both robust systems and interpersonal relationships is that um, I work to develop a, a FYI for your information reports to the board to talk about internal and, or external changes that have happened. And that has worked a lot to build a, kind of a foundation of trust so that people know that, you know, if, if there's anything happening that isn't really necessarily violating a policy but they might want to know about, whether it's media attention or the fact that the co-op got robbed, um, they, they're going to get that information right away. And I do that in their board packet, and I do that over email as well. OK, thanks, Lori. Anyone else? Last chance? Um, yeah, I'll jump in. This is Amy. I just uh, take the time to, to work on what we've talked about tonight, developing the robust systems. We can all get distracted by, by other day-to-day -day things, but it's really critical to really take the time and stay focused on these things. In the long run, it's, it'll be much better off. Okay, that's great. I want to I want to thank our wonderful panelists, Amy, Lori, George, and Rosemary, for joining us. Uh, we're going to close it out. I want to thank um, Art uh, for helping me put together this uh, workshop. Thank you, Todd. All right, and I guess we'll uh, be saying uh, good night to everyone, and thank you all for participating. And uh, please do check out the library. There's, there's a lot more um, great uh, information, and I'm sure a lot of you have already taken a look. Um, but really, panelists, thank you so much.